Hi everyone, I'm Brady Volp, and today we're going to talk about testing line equipment, passives, coax cable, and many other things using the Nano VNA, which is a vector network analyzer, but it's a super small one powered by batteries. So this is episode 70. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm. We've been doing these for seven years, live streams and podcasts. Our, this is get your tech on get your tech on our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volt, founder of the Volt Firm. Glad to be back with us today is John Downey, CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. John, welcome back. Yeah, seventy sessions. That's a lot. We've been doing this for a while, sir. Yeah. So today, uh, God, this is going to be an awesome episode. I'm really excited about this because. Like I said, we got some really cool test equipment, this Nano VNA. We can test and find out if the cables are bad, if our passives are bad, even if our amplifiers are bad. This is going to be a lot of hands-on. I've got about nine different tests here that we're going to be testing. We're going to be showing you know, what return loss is, what insertion loss is. We, we've been doing lots of things where we find bad equipment, but we can't actually get to the root cause and really understand what that is. We're going to be showing you all about that today. We're going to be showing you why it's important to terminate, what end, what end of line terminators do when we go bad. We can actually see that in there. But first, I want to get to a question from one of our readers, uh, Jesse. And Jesse's been writing in on, he's been doing, he's a subscriber. He's been doing a lot of work, troubleshooting his own cable modem. He's, I think he's finally got to the root cause of what is it, what uh, the problem is that he's been having. Uh, so. The latest update from Jess, he said, I wanted to provide an update on my situation. I was able to exchange my Aris SB8200 modem for a new Aris SB200 hardware version 6 with Aris. Uh, he installed the modem. He swapped out his grounding block. Uh, he, he put in a new Holland grounder block with a, the frequency supported up to uh, 3 gigahertz. He put in a 10 dB attenuator in there in order to get his downstream levels and his upstream levels correct. He's now getting 225 megabits per second down and 11 megabits per second up with a ping time of 38 milliseconds, according to speedtest.net. His question is, he's, he's, getting, uh, he's looking at his air, event error log in the modem itself. He's getting a CM status event uh, that says, let's see here. CM status message sent event code 24, channel ID 25D said, MAC address, uh, this is MAC address OFDM, OFDMA profile ID 6. And uh, so, John, we sent this error to you. Event ID gives a number and stuff like that. Um, so he's, he's kind of wanting to know why he's getting this event code. And, and John, I think you, you're familiar with this CM status event that yeah, uh, he talked about. Um, I, 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 I didn't know which event he was talking about. And uh, I believe it was, uh, did you say... It was CM status message sent event type code 24. Yeah, and, and if you look up in the spec, CM status event 24 is spec recovery on OFTM profile. That just means the downstream 3.1 OFTM block um, forward error correction recovery. Um, normally, you would have a forward error correction um, drop or failure before you get a recovery, right? Like a loss of back lock on PLC is event 21. Um, so either way, he's getting a good response mm -hmm. as opposed to a negative response, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so and he's getting good speeds too. I mean, he's getting good yeah. download, good upload speeds. And compared to where he was before, where he, he was having a lot of problems, his modem was going online and offline. And I think now with all the, the work, he's he's done a lot of hard work replacing his ground block, putting in the padding that we recommended. And I think he's now to a point where he solved his issues. Yeah, it might have nothing to do with the modem. It might have had to do with the padding. Yep. You know, if he's overdriving the downstream, uh, it can create distortions in the downstream that affect the upstream, kind of, kind of like common path distortion. Right. Higher downstream signals intermixing causing distortions on the upstream. Um, and it very well could have been. I mean, if you put a 10 dB pad in and dropped his levels all by 10, it must have been pretty high to begin with. Yeah. So, Jesse, I want to say good job, man. I, I think you really uh, you, you put your effort in. You read up on things. You understood the situation. And you corrected your own, your own in-home issue. Uh, so, congratulations. Nice job. It's also good that they can still get into the, uh, the web page of the modem. 
you know, yes. a lot of a lot of MSOs kind of block that capability or they change the default password, which is password or <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> you know, the admin, the, admin. He was always 192.168.100.1. But then I've seen a, a few routers and uh, that were 192.168.1.1. Uh, so sometimes you got to figure out what your gateway address is and maybe you can get into that IP address. But there's other times that, uh, <laughs> once the modem has its own IP, then you can't get to that internal 192 address or, uh, yeah, I don't know if you've done much with that as well, Brady, you know, trying to, trying to get into the modems diagnostics page. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time there and it, I did a couple of videos on that as well for subscribers. And we've got some really positive feedback on that. Even talking to subscribers about, you know, looking for damaged cables within your house, loose connectors, which we're going to talk about that in today's video, how loose connectors absolutely impact the the quality of signal to go through it impacts your return loss which we're going to we're going to get onto that right now so uh you know speaking of that um i've done some videos on this nano vna vna standing for vector network analyzer and uh, uh you know john when you and i worked at secor uh i spent a lot of time i mean i spent i spent months and years sitting in front of a vector network analyzer uh building rf amplifiers building yeah, fiber nodes and things like that. And the vector network analyzer was the go-to piece of equipment that lets you understand if a piece of equipment was good or if a piece of equipment was bad. And the, the super cool thing is um, folks have come out with this little tiny $35 piece of device here, device here called a nano VNA. It does the same thing as the 20, 30, 40, 50, and they go even up at a higher in cost. Uh, a vector network analyzers are professional things that we we used to work on so um what this little device does here is it it uh sends out a signal and the the signal going outbound is injected into any piece of equipment that you want to do and we're, we're going to see this real shortly here we'll be measuring a mainline tap we'll be seeing how good this tap is uh so the signal comes out it measures how much energy is going into the device. It also measures how much energy is getting reflected back. And that's, that's you know, reflected signal or uh, like reflections. Spectrum. Across a complete spectrum? Uh, yeah, so this goes all the way from 50 kilohertz up to 1.5 gigahertz. So we're, we're able to see the entire cable spectrum. And more importantly, we can see the output and also the input. So we transmit and receive on this device we can see what the problems are. So uh, the two terms we're going to be talking about today are return loss and insertion loss. The first one is return loss. And now I'll throw the question out to you, John. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how much time you spent with return loss, but what's your experience? And, and can you describe to people what return loss is? You know, to, to me, I used to say return loss is kind of uh, is, is a vague type of term. Um, I'd almost like to call it reflection loss the the more the better right the more loss to the reflection the better the the impedance match is if you have an impedance mismatch signal reflects so you want uh, a high return loss a high reflection loss um so the higher number the better usually above 20 db is great if you look at the spec on passives you might see a 20 db return loss but it also means that that was under perfect conditions. Everything was 75 ohms. Your craftsmanship was perfect. Uh, you didn't take the uh, center conductor of your coax and scrape the copper off of it. You know, so everything had to be perfect, right? Uh, for good return loss. So uh, when you see numbers being thrown around, it's assuming everything was done uh, perfectly, which normally it isn't. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a, that's a, a great way of putting it. Um, so there's something that in any system, we want to have what's called the maximum transfer of power. Maximum transfer of power means if we send a signal out, that sig 100% of that signal arrives at the source. So in, in cable TV and everything that we do, our sources, our transmitters, our CMTSs, our amplifiers, they're all designed to have a 75 ohm impedance. In order to get a maximum transfer of power, if the transmitter, like our CMTS, is 75 ohms, we want our receiver, which in, that might be our coax cable, our amplifiers, and the cable modem itself, wants to be 75 ohms too. And as long as everything's 75 ohms, we have 
optimal system, a maximum transfer of power, all the energy that's sent gets received at the device. Uh, so if we think about um, the source, in, in this case, it's going to be our nano VNA here. Uh, the source here, the transmitter, is 75 ohms. If we take our, our, our load, which was sitting around here, I've managed, oh, here it is, it's in my Cal kit. And by the way, uh, the, the manufacturer of the, the nano VNA, do you have a name for it or you don't? You don't want to plug them or <laughs> no there's a couple different manufacturers of them i okay. think most of them are based in china but this is an open source project so if you want to build this yourself you can get the schematics for it you can get the parts list and and you can build this on your own this particular one i bought off of amazon mm -hmm. uh the one that i i have on my desk the one that's running right here came from amazon uh, the one that i'm holding in my hand right here came from ebay um so that I, there's different manufacturers of them out there yeah. So you, you can get think, them lots of different you know, places, but they're like point, 35 bucks. Yeah, I know. But you mentioned 1.5 gig, but now we're talking Doxus 4.0 ESD, you know, 1.8 gig. Would There's be a three optimal. gigahertz version out there as well yeah. that you can get. Yeah, so okay. if you want to go to even higher ones, you can you can go up to, to three gigahertz. Was it more expensive? Probably. Right? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more expensive. And, and uh, I just haven't got that one yet. I'm <laughs> getting it soon. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically for ESD reasons. Um, so, you know, large cable operators, they'll probably get the, the big expensive uh, uh, vector network analyzer versions. But what I like about this, if you're a smaller cable operator and you want to be testing equipment in your head end to, you know, maybe make sure that a tap is good or a piece of coax is good, uh, these, bu these are very budget friendly that you can use and, and yeah. set up and get working. And let me, ex let me uh, clarify ESD. Uh, extended spectrum doxus in case other people listening think we're talking about uh, electrostatic discharge, <laughs> which we're not. <laughs> so the, 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 this brings to mind a problem I had, and that was, you know how doxus combining in the upstream at the head end could be one node is an upstream port on the CMTS, but you have other services in the head end that might be four to one, like upstream reverse sweep upstream sweep. So you might have four nodes combined into one port of a, a path track system. When you draw this all out, you could find that the fiber optic receiver has a path through the splitters and combiners and load and shows up on other ports of the CMTS. You didn't want it to, but it does because of all these combiners and splitters in the head end. And then what happens is Customers sometimes say, well, I don't need to combine those four nodes for upstream sweep, so I'm just going to disconnect it, and they forget to remove the actual cable. They disconnect it and let it hang there. That's worse than disconnecting the cable because of that length of coax, yes. which is, I think is what you're going to show some of this stuff. And, and we're how, going to show how, how yeah. critical that is, how important terminators are um, on exactly what you're talking about. We'll show we'll okay. show exactly what happens when you unterminate something, and it's it's ugly, man. It's really ugly. Yeah. So um, so let's dive right in. I, I want to show like uh, what happens when we get into what we're talking about with maximum transfer of power. So I'm, I'm taking the output of the VNA here, and I'm putting a perfect load on. So this is a a this is a calibrated three gigahertz seventy five ohm load. And I've calibrated this VNA, and what we're seeing on this top trace here is what we call the um, uh, the S11 parameter or return loss. Uh, so we see a line here. This line that I'm putting my mouse over is right around minus 30 dBc. That is our return loss value. Minus 20. So the minus 20 dB return loss is where we have 99% of our energy going to the device and only 1% of that energy getting reflected back. Minus 30 dB return loss is where we have pretty much 100% of the energy being absorbed by this load and none of the energy being reflected back. So you can kind of say like minus 30 is the perfect condition and that, that's how I calibrated this VNA. I've, I've done a video about calibrating VNAs. Um, so you can check that if, you, if you're interested in what that is like. I'm not going to do a calibration here. Um, so if we, you know, we talk about perfect transfer of power, our VNA is our source, our 75 ohm source, just like the CMTS would. It's transmitting signal out, and our load is would be like our, you know, our amplifiers or our cable modems in a in a perfect 75 ohm cable TV network. 
So everything's perfectly matched. We have no impedance mismatches. And because we have no impedance mismatches, we have no reflections being sent back to our, our transmitter. In this case, you know, we can think of that as our CMTS. So we have just, we pretty much have perfect return loss here nothing being reflected. If I take this terminator off, watch what happens to our return loss. Our return loss goes up to zero. A zero return loss means 100% of the signals that are being reflected are being, being sent through this coax cable are now being reflected back into our transmitter. If we think of our VNA as being like a CMTS, this would be the, the worst condition we could imagine. Everything's being- well, What's on the end of your cable? Is that an F81? It's just, a, just open. Yeah, that's just a, a, a F connector, uh, a, a barrel F, F connector. Barrel. All yeah. right, so what happens if you take the F81 barrel off? Like yep. A lot of people say, you know, uh, an unterminated pit. Um, Still just as bad. Yeah. So a barrel is not a terminator. Exactly. And, and I could take a regular, you know, one of these uh, off the shelf. I have some here. Well, let me let me pull one off of here. I can take an off-the-shelf terminator, and we can see that it does almost as good of a job as our calibrated terminator in bringing that return loss down. So you can see that return loss came way down from zero, and it's so here's our minus 20 dB line where I'm moving my marker here, and all you know it it doesn't do as good up to a gigahertz. So we're just above the minus 20 dB. Remember, minus 20 dB is where we have 99% of the energy being absorbed by this, you know, 10 cent uh, terminator. And these 10 cent terminators is what we'd like to have everywhere. And so I always say terminate everything. And we're going to see that as we go through uh, the rest of this. The second parameter that we want to talk about is insertion loss. So that is the bottom graph. And insertion loss measures basically how much signal is going through. So we can see in the bottom graph right now, it's it's basically in a noise floor. But when I connect the two cables together, now we're completing the circuit between channel zero and channel one. And we're basically now seeing how much signal is going through our two connectors here. And we can see our insertion loss went up to the uh, the zero dB reference here. And that's what we want to see, our insertion loss here. There's basically no... Uh, no loss between these cables. And the reason there's no loss is because I calibrated the system with these cables in place because all the measurements going forward is we're going to be measuring, you know, how much loss, for example, is through this 17 dB tap. So I'll go ahead and connect the but 17 dB Explain the tap. other device you have attached on there that you calibrated out. Uh, that's that's, that's a good point. So uh, one of the, one of the, uh, this nano VNA is a 50 ohm device. And remember I said, everything in our, our, our cable network is 75 ohms. So I have to put this 50 to 75 ohm matching pad. And this is called a minimum loss matching pad. Uh, it has 5.7 dB a loss, but it converts 50 ohms to a 75 ohm world, and that allows me to use the nano VNA to measure 75 ohm devices. If I try to connect a 50 ohm measurement device, this nano VNA, which is 50 ohms, directly to a 75 ohm device, then I would have an impedance mismatch. I would be creating my own reflections, and I would never be able to measure uh, return loss down to you know minus 20 or minus 30 dB because I already have an impedance mismatch in my system and I would then be I, I probably the best return loss I'd be able to measure is minus 10 dB and doing any of the measurements going forward would be completely worthless because all I'd be able to show you is ah, return loss is only like 10, 10 dB return loss because I have an impedance mismatch so that's the that's the importance of this device right here did the Nano come with the 50 ohm black cables? Uh, it came with the 50 ohm black cables and it came with a, a uh, 50 ohm calibration kit. So uh, if you want to get one of these, you're going to have to get your own 50 to 75 ohm matching pads and you will have to get your own calibration kit. I, I do have a, a video on calibrating the 75 ohm and I'm working on a video to make your own 75 ohm calibration kit. That'll probably come out next week. Nice. And, and explain uh, the difference between that 5.7 dB 
uh, minimum loss pad versus a 1.76 dB loss um, a transformer. A transformer. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, you know, that's a good point that you bring up, John. They do make um, matching pads that have transformers in them that have a lot less loss than 5.7 dB. The problem with using those is they work over a small frequency range. And in broadband, by definition of broadband, we work over a very large frequency span. In, in fact, this nano VNA, I have it set up from 50 to 1 gigahertz. For today's testing, it can go from 50 kilohertz to 1.5 gigahertz. And, and like I said, there's another nano VNA that'll go from 50 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz. Uh, that's why I use this 5.7 min loss pad because it's this goes uh, all the way up to 3 gigahertz. The matching pads that have transformers on them that have very low loss, those work over just a very small frequency range. Those are normally used for antennas that are also going to operate over maybe just you know a couple of megahertz or 10 or 20 megahertz. And those are perfect for those if uh, for that purpose, if you're not going to be running over a long, a wide frequency range where we are. Yeah. But for cable applications, like what we're doing, we're measuring very wide bandwidth, you're going to want to use this type of matching pad, uh, 5.7 dB minimum loss pad. Very good. So uh, first thing, first test we're going to do, I have like nine different tests I, I want to try to get in today. I don't think we're going to, um, but if we'll get as many as we, we can today, and then we'll see what happens. So the first test we're going to do, um, I'm plugging into the input of this mainline tap. This is a 70, 17 dB uh, Regal tap. And I'm gonna put the input or the output into, you know, basically what you'd normally tap off of here. Uh, so as we can see, let's look at the insertion loss first. So insertion loss here is zero dB. And then that's our reference up here. And then if we look down here, I've marker one and marker two and marker three. And we can see our markers are saying, uh, the S21 gain, which is basically telling us how much loss there is, is, well, look, 17.4. Uh, marker 2 is at 16.9. And marker 3 is up at uh, minus 15. So we have a 17 dB uh, mainline tap. And off of this port, we're getting 17 dB of loss. No surprise, right? That's, is, that's what you expect, John. Correct. Now and, then, and and does it actually the the cutoff there is it right at say five megahertz? Because you said you're actually scanning from fifty kilohertz correct. all the way up. So I can move my marker one uh, right to the edge there, and and I can also change my frequency. So I, I I've can... seen some taps, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It might be a good thing in disguise. Some taps actually start at ten megahertz. Yeah, and many people don't know that. So let me change the stop frequency to 100 megahertz and sweep, and that'll give us a better idea of, of what the uh, stop frequency is. Uh, let me put marker one right where the peak is, and we can see marker one, basically where the tap stops working at, is right around two megahertz. So you know, again, this is a, a great thing that you could do with your nano VNA if you wanted to characterize how low does my tap go. Uh, we can see that it goes all the way down to two megahertz. It goes below five megahertz, where most people, most people are going to use it. Uh, yeah. But it does, it does roll off really sharp, right at two megahertz. I've seen some taps purposely roll off at ten, because if you think about it, that could help eliminate or alleviate all the ingress yes. below ten megahertz that comes from houses by filtering it with the tap itself. Yep. It's and and, and again, every tap manufacturer is different. Um, it, also, you may want to know how high in frequency does my tap go. Um, so if we go back to the overhead here, I'm stopping it. Uh, I'm going to put it back to 1,000 megahertz and start my sweep again. Um, so we can see this, this tap is nice and flat all the way out to 1,000 megahertz, which if you're thinking about, you know, can I extend my plant out from 860 to maybe a, a gigahertz? You'll want to sweep your tap and say, uh, you know, do my existing taps in my plant go out to a gig? Um, as I said, this goes to 1.5 gig. Maybe I want to know if it goes out to 1.2 or 1.3, even higher. You can do that with a nano VNA. 
another thing that's interesting, and um, this this is kind of one of the tests I want to show. This tap has a terminator on the end. Maybe this tap is at the end of line. Uh, terminators are incredibly important. So let's see what happens when I take this terminator off. And, and importantly, I, I want to show what happens from a return loss standpoint. So we can see here, we have pretty good return loss on this tap. Here's our minus 20 dB line. We're almost minus 20 dB. And remember, minus 20 dB, we have 99% of the signal going through until our terminator goes bad. Or you know, maybe I forgot to put my terminator on, or maybe the terminator was blown due to a surge. So look what happens when we have no terminator on this tap. Our return loss drops all the way down. If I look at our, our green marker here, that green marker, marker two, is showing a return loss of minus 2.2. So if I go to my little, I have a little return loss reference here. I think you said you did too, John, but a return loss of 2 dB has a reflection of 63%. So that means 63% of the energy that I'm sending into this tap is being reflected back to the head end. So that means a lot of the energy that I'm trying to send, like those downstream DOCSIS channels that I'm sending into this, a lot of that energy is getting reflected back. The same thing is true if I have a cable modem that's transmitting towards the head end and this terminator is blown. 63% of that energy coming from that cable modem is getting reflected back to the cable modem. And now the cable modem has to transmit at a higher power in order for it to have 0 dB MV receive level at the CMTS. So the importance of a terminator on, on our taps, on the output of our taps, is incredibly important. Yeah, the, the, the other example could be that was supposed to be a 4-port 8 dB tap which is a self-terminating tap. Oh, I got that and coming housing, up next. It's like the housing could be a self-terminating housing, but someone took the faceplate off and put a four port 17 dB, dB tap in, yep. which doesn't have self-termination inside, but then the housing didn't have a terminator on the outside, so you didn't think about it. It's, yes. Either way, it was incorrect, right? Correct. Correct. So the taps, Nowadays, because we do node updates and we might want to turn amplifiers around, the taps sometimes can be turned around. Correct. Flip yeah, them. It's... What if you put it in backwards? You know, what if the, what if you, their input and output are opposite or like. Yeah, they're... on these, they're not, re the tap faces are not reversible, but on, on ones that are, yeah, it's problematic. I mean, you could put your input cable on the output of the tap to see what happens to your insertion loss. Or so instead of 17 dB loss, it's gonna be okay. 17 plus the dot directional coupler uh, that's internal. So that's gonna be like 20, but it might be 37 dB of loss, you know? Let's, let's, let's reverse it. Let's do that test right now. Plugging it in here. Let's see how much insertion loss we have. So this is test number 10. <laughs> this is a new test. Another test for you. Oh, so, so check that out. It's just like you said, John, if we look at our insertion loss, um, so first of all, instead of it being flat, we have positive tilt on the insertion loss, but the insertion loss on marker uh, 2, instead of being 17 dB, we have 28 dB of insertion loss. So yeah, that, to, to your point, if, if, you, if you put this tap in reverse, like you're saying, you know, we just flipped it around the wrong way, yeah, you're going to get a lot more insertion loss on this tap than, than what you inspe inspect, yeah. expected and, and, to get. And, and if, the, if the modem has enough power level to overcome it, it'll work, but then you'll be scratching your head saying, why is it transmitting so hot? You know, what's going on? Or why is the stuff downstream not working? You know? Yeah. So that arrow on the tap that shows the direction of signal flow, that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> that arrow means something. It's just a sticker. Yeah. <laughs> the sticker yeah. Don't peel the sticker off and flip it around. It's not going <laughs> to fool anyone. You're still going to be wrong at the end of the day. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show on this tap, let me put this back to where it should be, is to talk about, you know, should we terminate all the ports on the tap? And, and uh, it's kind of an interesting test because we're going to see two different things between two different taps. I, I have to just get back and terminate yeah, this. Have them all terminated to begin with, right? I do have them all terminated. You notice that. Um, so if we get back to the screen here, 
uh, the overhead. We'll see right now we have really good return loss. We have my, pretty much minus 20 dB return loss. So 99% of the signal's going through. Everything's terminated. I'm going to start taking off the terminators here. Actually, what I'll do is uh, I'm going to do a cool thing here. I can set a reference. So set a current reference. And now as I take the terminators off, we'll see the return loss and as it, if it changes as I take these terminators off. And this is a 17 dB a tap. So you can see now we have two lines there. We have the blue line, which was the original reference, and then we have the yellow line that shows by taking off the terminators, our return loss did get worse. No big difference in the insertion loss, but up here in the return loss, now uh, instead of having like 20 dB of return loss across, we can see where I put the, the red marker uh, now we went from 20 dB of return loss to 16.8 dB of return loss. That's still good return loss. So I can see a lot of people saying, ah, Brady, on a 17 tap, I don't need to terminate all these ports. I'm not going to argue with them. But let's see what happens when we put the 8 value tap in, which is a much lower value tap. John, what do you think is going to happen? So I, I, and the, how I looked at it logically was, um, to be realistic and the cost and what's the worst that could happen. If you terminate high value taps, do you get much advantage from it? Not really, because when signal goes through 17 dB and reflects it comes back, that reflected signal is down by 34 dB because it went through the tap both ways to reflect and come back. Now, if you look at a modem that's transmitting on say a 11 dB tap. The 11 dB tap doesn't have a lot of isolation from the tap port to the output. So it can go all the way down to the end of line 4 dB tap. And if the 4 dB tap is unterminated, that signal can go in and out pretty easily and come all the way back in the coax because of lower frequency and affect your original signal. Right. That's the problem, right? It's not just return loss and all that. It's reflected signal adding in and out of phase with the original signal. Then we get the standing waves, Yep. right? And that's why we need pre-EQ and all this other stuff because of micro reflections. Yes. So yeah, the lower value tap is going to have a more severe uh, problem. You're precisely correct. And that's so that's what we have here. I didn't have a four tap, which is the really severe condition, but I have an eight tap. And right now I have my eight tap set up. I set a reference on it. We have... Um, uh, interestingly, the ATAP doesn't have as good in, uh, insertion loss as the four, uh, as the, the, the 17 tap does. Uh, but you know, we're we're just a little bit above the return loss. The yeah, return loss. I'm yeah. sorry, but a little bit above the minus uh, 20 dB line here. But we can see on insertion loss, we we get what we expect, 8 dB of insertion loss. But I, I set a reference here, so I'm going to start to remove my. Uh, so everything's terminated here. I'm going to start to take off my terminators on my 8 dB tap. Look at the difference just taking off one terminator does on this 8 dB tap. That's huge. So we now insertion loss didn't change, but our return loss went from a low value to a, a really high value, especially at low frequencies. We're, we're now at 16. And as I take them off, I take another hit. So now I have two out of the two terminated ports, we're at minus nine dB return loss right now. So at minus nine, we have like 14%, or we've got a good bit of, ooh, that guy's on there. <laughs> Pro proper torquing, right? Yes. Now <laughs> I take off that last terminator, we're now down to minus five dB return loss. At minus five dB return loss, we have 32% uh, of the signal being reflected back to our source. So this this brings up a, a, a question I've always had was, I know the design of a tap to have four ports. It's really two splitters to create the four ports. Then those two splitters go to the other splitter to it have it again because there's no through leg on a four port 8 dB tap. It's a self-terminating tap. So it's a splitter yep. getting two other splitters. So my question would be is, the signal level you're on, the port that's unterminated on that first combining splitter is more critical than the other one. So I'd like you to put the, the, the terminator back on and disconnect one to the side or one to the bottom first to see which one is worse. 
what I'm saying? Yeah, so um, yeah, put them the on, last go back to reference. Yeah, put them all back on. Okay. You know, so if we put them all back on, we'll get our reference back again. Gosh, I have to do a lot of work in I this. Uh, this in is this... like test number 11. <laughs> Add it, added to the script. I've always claimed that depending on which port is unterminated could have a different effect. Yep. Because I, don't uh, but, know but the I think splitter. I think fundamentally you agree on low value taps, we should be terminating all ports, right? Yes. Uh, so let me let me reset my reference. Okay. Uh, so before I move these ones, which were the the ones aside, and the last one I unterminated was this one. Uh -huh. uh, so which one would you like me to take off first? The the one above or the one to the side? Let's uh, look at it's changing just as you touch it. <laughs> but oh, I did. Grounding. You need a new reference level again. Yeah, let me make sure everything's <laughs> tight here. There, oh, I think I had a loose connect. I wasn't tight there. Okay, we're back to where the reference was. All right, so let's take off the upper right one, yeah. This one here. Yeah. Yeah, because we take them off and just put them back on. So that took us down to minus 9 dB return loss. Did you do multiple reference levels or no? No, unfortunately, I can't. Not on not on this software. Not on this version yet. <laughs> so. well, you could just use that new graph as a new reference level. And you want to we'll set that it. as a reference, or yeah. you want to put the terminator back on and take off a different terminator. Yep, exactly. Put it back on. So that took us to minus nine. The one above. We'll take off the one to the left. So I think that's what you're saying. Is uh, you're expecting one may could be worse than the other. Yep. Yeah, that one right there. Oh, that is interesting, John. That so the one beside has absolutely pretty much no impact, and I think that's what you're saying. I, I think what it is, we just found out that the the one you're connected to and the one above it are on the same internal splitter. Let's see this one here. Yep. So that one has. So if you touch either of these ones, they have more of an impact. Yeah. So I, you know, I think the bottom line is terminating low value splitters, eight, four splitters, that's really important. Uh, maybe 17 and higher, not so much. Yeah. The, 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 the pitfall to terminating the higher value splitters is they don't give you as much bang for the buck. And literally buck, it costs money. And the other part would be, are you setting yourself up for potential problems if that terminator goes bad? Because right. an unterminated spigot doesn't leak signal, but a resistor in there, 75 ohm resistor, that's broken is going to leak like a sieve. So you're creating more leakage. You could be creating a problem, you yes. know, um, if you don't do it properly. And then, then you say you're breaking the water seal as well, hermetically sealed. Uh, are these terminators? Do they have an O-ring in them? <laughs> Maybe not. If they don't have an O-ring, then you might be opening up to water. But, well, at least the ones I have have O-rings. These all, all have O-rings in them, but... All right. Yeah, so, all right, uh, the next test here, common uh, two-way splitter. Uh, normally, this is the leg coming in from the cable operator. Uh, this leg here, let's say, goes to your cable modem. I'm just terminating it because uh, we're feeding our cable modem here, and this other leg right here is going to our set-top box. Um, so... We're all nice and happy. Let me uh, set my reference again. Uh, everything feeding our set-top box. Uh, oh, actually, I, I, let me put this to my cable. Let me let's do it this way. So we can see that the signal going to our cable modem is nice and happy. We've got a nice flat signal going into our cable modem here with about uh, you know three and a half to four dB of loss, which is what we normally expect. And this, by the way, is the typically the best setup uh, going into any subscriber's home where uh, you have a two-way splitter, one leg feeding the cable modem, one leg feeding the rest of the house. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. Actually, it's about three and a half dB of loss across the whole board, the whole band. That's a good splitter. Certainly some of them, you know, they, they can a little be bit five more. dB of loss at one gig sometimes. Yes. Now, what happens, um, what's going to happen is that this subscriber decides uh, they don't want the set-top box anymore, so they're going to disconnect the set-top box and send it back to the cable operator. And now, now look what happens. Um, our return loss 
gets really bad because what happens is we have an unterminated cable and if I change my if I change my reference here on a data axis to automatic uh, set reference you see what's happening in my insertion loss here a standing wave it's a standing wave so we start to get the ripple there it be and relative to the length of that unterminated coax correct you could you could calculate that length of the unterminated coax so um, you know this happens all the time people this is just a coax running in in a subscriber's house and they disconnect their tv set they disconnect their set top boxes and normally it's not just one co unterminated coax it's many um, so this is just a short coax. You saw the length of that standing wave. Um, if we it's hook on, you, you mentioned about the coax went to the set top box, and you you showed the set top box as a terminator. But in reality, the set top box doesn't have perfect impedance match either. Yes, so it's <laughs> oftentimes the set top boxes only have like six dB return loss, but it's still yeah. better than a than a perfect open. Yeah, um, I'm. The piece of cable that I had on before was this white cable here. This is, it's about six feet long. Um, now I hooked on a piece of orange coax cable here, which is, uh, you know, maybe this is running to a new, another room. This is about 20 foot long. If we look back at our, at our overhead here, we'll see, remember before there was a standing wave that, you know, yeah. looked kind of long, but now looking back at the overhead, we can Other see distance. now Other we have range. a much, uh, a standing wave that has a much higher frequency in that standing wave. Uh, what so, I call tighter ringing, right? It's yeah, tighter, it's much tighter. tighter. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we can do, like using P and M, is you can count uh, basically the wavelength or how, how many of those standing waves are, and you can estimate the length of this coax cable that's attached. Uh, but the again, getting back to best practices, the way that you can fix that the way that you can make that standing wave go away and fix that really bad return loss that you're seeing. Remember, when a return loss is really bad, that cable modem is going to be losing energy. We have micro reflections, is just terminate everything. So if we go back to the screen, we'll see that that standing wave went away and our return loss went way down and got much better. The impact that's gonna have on a cable modem now is it's, when it's transmitting its signal back to the CMTS, is much less of the signal is going to be reflected back to the cable modem. That's called a micro-reflection. The cable modem is going to be able to transmit with a lower transmit power to have the same receive level back at the CMTS. I, mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, that one's a touchy one there. I mean, it's reflected signal adding in and out of phase, and we're hoping pre-equalization can take care of that. In regards to actual transmit level, I guess depending on what frequency we're looking at and the standing wave height, mm -hmm. if the standing wave is one or two dB, then yeah, I mean, it could be off by a couple of dB of actual transmit level. Um, I think the biggest concern is the fact that you're getting a reflected signal adding in and out of phase and not just level, but creating uncorrectable FEC, you know, low MER. Um, I would be more concerned with that. Yeah. But, but also, so I mean, it, it impacts the downstream because we get that standing wave and now the cable modem has to use its equalizer in the downstream to compensate for that. In the upstream, when the cable modem's using its pre-equalizer to compensate for the standing wave, it's, it's using energy in order to do that pre-equalization compensation. So that's what we're challenged with there. All right, so those are our pre-equalizer ones. Um, so loose connectors, uh, and I- Do you I, do uh, splitter port-to-port -port isolation? You just went through the splitter for insertion loss and an unterminated Right. Um, so port-to-port -port isolation, we can do that. How so, do you want to do that, John? Just, uh, two red wires, yeah, go two red wires on the yep. two output ports, terminate the input port, and, and, and if you terminate the input port, that should show um, port to port isolation, which really is insertion loss, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it should be, I think, over 20 dB. It's, that's normally what it's supposed to be. So it's actually kind of an ugly looking splitter there. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing port to port isolation. Here's our 20 dB reference here. So we have better than 20 dB across the board, port to port isolation, which is exactly the number you said. 
Yep. And if you take the Terminator out, see, everything's assumed that that 20 dB port to port isolation is with a perfect 75 ohm input. If you take that off, say the signal should go through, reflect 100%, come back, and you only lose three and a half, three and a half. So it should only be 7 dB of port to port isolation when you take the Terminator off. Yes. Is it, um, is it or is it frozen? Uh, yeah, the screen just froze up on us. <laughs> <laughs> so. Call me. So, so what, what we do see on, on my screen here is that the uh, insertion loss went to, from, from that better than 20, it went to, uh, right now I'm showing about uh, 8 dB of isolation on the screen. So yeah. to your point, we have really good insertion loss when these are, when we have a terminator on here, and then you take that terminator off, uh, insertion loss, just uh, completely. Let's not call it insertion. Isolation. Isolation, isolation yeah. between the two ports gets bad, and yeah. so that's a critical thing to know about these terminators. Um, when they work, they they work good if you have a good impedance. It's not you know it's not that you need a terminator on there, but it's expecting again we have a 75 ohm network coming out, and if there's something that makes that other than 75 ohm, it's not going to work good at you, all. You and I talked before we started the podcast. Uh, when Radio Shack was still around, people used to go in and get coax, not realize that RG58 was 50 ohm coax for, say, CB. Right. So you could have 50 ohm coax in your house and not even know it. Yes. You know, and then open up the 75 ohm coax. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so those are a lot of things. Um, we have some more tests here, but um, we're we're running up against the hour, um, but I think this should give people and, you know, maybe we'll come back and do a part two. And I, I, you know, I would ask everyone, first of all, if, if you liked what you saw, please do hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. That'll help us know um, if, if this is something you want more information on, we'll do a part two on this because I've got a few more tests that I'd like to do. We've got some water soak cable. We've got a diplex filter. We've got some other filters that we'd like to give information on. I've got some more tests over here. Um, we're just running out of time. Diplex, the di the diplex. I got to add in. I got to kick this in before I forget. Diplex filter is interesting because I'm running into this in in home house amplifiers, where the diplex filter rolls off right where it says it's supposed to, but then it comes back up a little bit instead of just rolling off like a. And, and, and being say 30 dB of loss in the no man's land, it actually comes up a little bit. So if I'm doing 585 megahertz, by placing a signal right at 50, there might be enough roll off to block it. But if I place the signal at 60, the filter seems to come up again. So it yeah. might actually work. It's almost like the diplex filter is a triplex filter, if you will. Now, it, it, there's some weird stuff sometimes by just looking at a diplex filter's response with say that network analyzer you have. One other thing I wanted to bring up, and a good test might be, this just came up, I think, in LinkedIn. Someone was asking about the iStop. Remember the iStop from Trilithic? It was called an ingress stop? Yes, and yes. And all it really was was probe with, say, a KS, uh, probe a seizure screw, and you hit a little button, and it created an impedance mismatch on purpose so that you would see about 60 dB of insertion loss. Right. I thought it was a cool idea because it was in parallel instead of in series with the circuit. And then you just hit a little button, create an impedance mismatch. And then if you saw the head end signal drop by 6 dB, you know you were on the right leg where ingress was coming in. Yep. No, that totally well, makes sense. Is you don't want to leave it on too long because then the cable motors would readjust their levels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or reboot. <laughs> Go off. Yeah, or reboot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be interesting if you ever got your hands on one of those. And when we yeah. could see that, you know, see what really happens. Yes. So, and I, Another thing with these nano VNAs, which I think I mentioned to you um, before we got started, John, is they're battery powered. So you could you could take these out in the field, and I'd be interested, you know, from what everyone saw today, you know, please put your comments below. Uh, I mean, I'm curious, you know, could you see someone running these out into the field and actually testing with something like this out in the field? Uh, it's definitely something, you know, we could we could test taps in the field. Um, we could test coax in the field. We could, and and they're cheap. So if you damage one or drop one, you just pick up another one. So we do have some comments up here um, from Green. Uh, it looks like one for you, John. He says that is also interesting sounding. Uh, 
uh, what it means. He's saying the range response. I think this is back to our question at the beginning. Range response, C cap command power in excess of 6 dB below the value corresponding to the cap of the DRW. Do you remember what yeah, that was? That, that one there, let's see what it means. What's that? I, mean, I mean, I think that uh, the power level being transmitted between multiple channels uh, from that cable modem are beyond the, the, the dynamic range window of 12 dB. Um, if you're trying to send a signal at say 15 megahertz and another upstream channel at say 85 megahertz, and because of all the coax loss, and temperature, whatever, and the 85 megahertz, and it could be a filter too, so that's to overcome the filter loss. So the cable modem's like, I need 51 dB, dBmV at 85, but I only need 30 dB at 10 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Well, that's 20 dB difference. That's not legal. Yes. Only 12 dB range is, is legal between all the channels, the transmit levels. I mean, there is a workaround to that. Could be if, if, if you can't fix it out in the field, I could fool the system by changing the CMTS receive level config. Right. If if the higher frequency needs more level, I could say, well, let's set up the higher frequency in the CMTS to minus three. So now the modem has to transmit three dB less. So maybe now it gets closer to the 12 dB a window with the lower frequency. Mm -hmm. Granted, you're getting lower MER. <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. But yeah. uh, you know, don't put your taps in reverse because that's going to make. <laughs> that's going to make things even worse on your return. Yeah, I mean, you should just fix the problem, what's causing the problem. All right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, Tech Danik, you did see the, uh, it wasn't a 7 dB, but it was an 8 dB tap. Um, definitely terminate your terminators that, or terminate your ports. That's going to help on the low value taps. And uh, Johnstown TWC, or Johnston well, ah, sorry, I'm not sure what your name, how to pronounce your name there. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in a part two, please do put your comments below. Let us know because we do have more tests we can show. And that would be something, if we have interest, we will do a part two on this you as well. A point of, could you take this out in the field and use it? But if a tap is physically hooked up to the cable, you have to probe. As soon as you probe, you create an impedance mismatch. Yeah. No, so I, that'd be interesting too. It's like I can see probing for troubleshooting, but not for accurate measurements. Right. I, I think this is something. It's obviously as as you've seen from the testing today, uh, like these taps. I had to take out the the. You would consider an stinger that yeah. This is a stinger that you're going to have in the field. You're not going to be able to connect the VNA up to this. You're yeah. going to have to put uh, a, a, an F or an N type connector in here in order to be able to measure this. This is not an in-service test. This is a test where, you know, maybe you want to verify a tap is good. You're going to pull it out and put it in, into some type of test fixture in order to make that way. measurement. At, at number 13 to your list, is there a way to take the faceplate off and measure it through the stinger ports of the faceplate? I, I think that's going to be really difficult uh, because you're also you're not going to have the same grounding that you would have in, in this faceplate here. So... Uh, I could take this, you know, obviously the faceplate comes off. I could have this same fixture with F connectors, and then I could take this faceplate out in the field and put it in another faceplate. Mm -hmm. And that would give me the ability just to make sure that the overall tap itself was good. Yeah. I could do the same thing with an amplifier module. I could have an amplifier housing with F connectors on it and take the VNA out. I could take an amplifier module out. Put it in a test module of course i'd have to power it and then i could look at the return loss of that amplifier make sure return loss is good check my gain uh so i could measure gain of an amplifier i could i could basically make sure that that amplifier has gain all the way out to 860 or a gig make sure it has the correct gain make sure there's no suck outs and things like that so the I, and this is this like i said this is the same thing that i i sat down on for years and years and designed and built rf amplifiers with so you'd have, be basically doing the same thing that an RF engineer is going to do when they're designing it, just to make sure that it's still working. So like a QA person would be able to do that same type of work and say, yes, this meets the specification uh, that, the, that the engineer designed it to. And they could use the same spec sheet and say, uh, my S11, my, you know, my insertion loss is doing what it's supposed to. My S21, which is the insertion loss, is doing what it is supposed to per the spec sheet. Yeah, you, I... 
I just thought also about pulling out the faceplate. I've seen different reactions with the power passing taps. So when you pull out the faceplate, the power passing bar would usually jumper across the two ports. And, and that'd be interesting to see how modems downfield get, how they react, right? Right. Because now you took out the insertion loss of the tap and you created a, a, a jumper across so the signal is maybe higher, higher level in the first place. You pull the faceplate out. Yep. Yeah. And some of these things, yeah. the best way to do it is just by testing it. So I, I think the Nano VNA is bringing a new world, new opportunity for cable operators and even subscribers. If you're a subscriber and you're having problems with like in-home coax, you want to know if that coax is good or bad, you can test it with this. I, I have a pile of coax sitting over here to my right that I was going through, and I found so many pieces of coax that were bad that I didn't realize were bad until I started testing with this. So it's an awesome opportunity to do that type of work. Test every piece of coax before you take it out of the field. The, I have the fix to all this. Home gateway, no coax. <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi and Ethernet throughout the house. <laughs> yep. Yep. Get rid That's of the coax. The coax is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's funny about that is no matter what uh, conducting medium you use, um, there's other hur hurdles and yeah. issues. There's always something. Yep. So, all right, John. Time to wrap this up. A great episode. Thanks so much for your time today. Everyone, thanks for joining. Please do. Put your comments below. Let us know what you liked. If you want to hear more, we're glad to do it. Give us a thumbs up if you like the episode. That always helps us. Uh, you can watch us live on YouTube. You can watch the reruns and also catch our podcast. The podcast of this episode is going to be a tough one to listen to because there's a lot on here. Um, so thanks. We'll be back, I think, in two weeks with more. Um, so we'll see you. Stay tuned. And thanks for watching. Take care.